called Seek, Give, Pray, Go. Um, and last week we really focused on the seek part. Tonight we're going to look at the give part. And uh, But before I get going, I remembered what it was I was going to say last week. Remember I said as soon as that, I'm telling you guys, it wasn't even when I went to, went to bed. I was walking down the aisle to uh, put something up after, after service. And I turned to Diana and Gracie and said, I remember what it was. So I wrote it down, guys. Um, we were talking about the way that I was really proud of my young adult group because they're pushing past where they were before. They're pushing into new areas of growth. And I mentioned Nicole specifically, and I remember what it was. Uh, when I first met Nicole, she was a very shy girl, you know, uh, kind of just wanted to keep to the back and just kind of leave me alone, and I won't look at you, and you won't look at me. And uh, so we had a few awkward, you know, interactions of, you know, joking, but, you know, didn't really land. You know, when you try to tell jokes, somebody just yeah. fall on your face. It's kind of like that. It's like, eh, this was awkward. So after that, um, you know, I started up a young adult group, and she started coming, and uh, uh, we got to know each other, and, and now it's now it's a lot, a lot less awkward when we joke. Uh, but I remember what, what it was. Um, she got involved two years ago with VBS. And if you don't know, that's that's a, a week long. It's like a day camp we do in summer for the kids. And this is not Nicole. I mean, you know, she's just a very big introvert. She's like me. And you know, she stepped out of that. She stepped out of that and, and, and stepped forward and did this. And it was just so cool to see her getting involved in something that was just so far beyond what she said. Oh, I'll never be able to do that. And uh, it was just so good to see that. Uh, this year, she went to women's conference. Um, Carmen also went to a women's yes. conference. Uh, Carmen stepped up in a big way uh, with uh, helping out with the nursery and stuff. I couldn't be more proud of her, you know. Uh, and another girl that I always felt was, you know, very um, withdrawn, kind of shy, and she she stepped up and she did it. Was, she's doing a great job too. Um, in fact, she helped out with VBS too, and was really one of the best uh, youth helpers that we've ever had, if not the best. I mean, she was just she was it was, it was really cool to see her uh, step forward. Um, and do that. And another thing I was going to mention is Zach, uh, another guy that when I first started coming was very, uh, very shy, and he has never missed one of our young adults' um, trash cleanups. He has never missed one. He's been to every single one. And uh, this is a guy. He, once again, all of us in the young adults were were, were extreme introverts, but you know uh, he stepped out and, and did this, and it was so good to see. Uh, I had two more examples written down. Diana. Diana does not like working with kids, as far as I can tell. Uh, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong, but I, I, a couple years ago, man, I, I'm telling you, this woman was uptight. You know, I, I, if I would smudge the, the glass, man, she'd follow after me five minutes later and wipe that glass off. I mean, she, this woman was uptight when I first met her. And, uh, uh, well, we've been friends for a long time now, but, uh, uh, you know, she stepped up and started helping out with the, with the kids thing, much to Gracie's uh, joy. <laughs> And, uh, and the kids are like little terrorists. Can you imagine being stuck in there without a helper? Oh, goodness, no. <laughs> and, uh, um, but even, I mean, Gracie, too. I mean, this is, when I first met her, she's like, I, I never want to do kids' church. And then she's like, I think I'm going to do kids' church. And I was like, didn't you say you never wanted to do that? She's like, but no, no BS will do it. I was like, oh. Okay, uh, if you want to, buddy, but maybe you ought to think about it. Oh, I, I, I did. Oh, okay, well, good luck. I'll, uh, I'll buy you a nice plot in the, in the cemetery. And, uh, uh, you know, and not only does she, she do that, but she does 4-H. She does that. She does VPS every year. I mean, she just blows me away, this woman. You know, women, women are pretty amazing, if you think about it. Uh, you know, they, they throw away their, their, their teen body to give you children, and they do it willingly. And then they stay up all night caring for the child, and I mean, women are just amazing, you know, if you really think about it. Um, especially the throw-up thing. Oh, man. <laughs> uh, one time I was changing Micah's, Micah's dirty diaper, and I said, now, Gracie, you're, you're sure, you're sure that he's done, right? And she goes, yeah, yeah, he's done, surely he's done. So I take off the diaper and I go to wipe, and as soon as I take off the diaper, the floodgates. <laughs> All over my recliner, my nice new recliner. I was like, no! Come on! Well, now it's broken. Yeah, now it's broken. You don't have to worry about that. I, I would have burned it, except I was afraid that the smell would get worse. <laughs> uh, anyways, so 
So we're looking at this, and we're going to look looking at uh, part two, give. Now, all four of these things are, are, are connected, seeking, giving, praying, and going. That's why we're looking at them together. And uh, well, I'll come back to that. Uh, you know, I, adoption, adoption is a great idea. You know what I mean? And, and everybody thinks that they like the idea of adoption. You know, it, it sounds like a good idea, too. You know, you think, well, I'll be a hero. Everything will just go smoothly. And they'll be so thankful that I've adopted them that we'll never have any problems. <laughs> You're, those of you who have had kids, you already realize this isn't going to work how you think it's going to work out. Uh, but the reality is much different. It, it's definitely not like you thought. You know, there's when you're working with CYFD and that kind of stuff, there's kind of this, this um, deer in the headlights phase where you thought you had everything under control, you thought you understood kids, you thought you were the best parent in the world, and you actually have kids. And you realize, man, I have no idea what I'm doing with parenting. <laughs> and it only gets worse the longer you have kids. Uh, and the sad truth is that most people who adopt do it without support. That's most true. people who adopt have to do it by themselves. Mm -hmm. There really isn't a very strong community um, of people who are adopting. And there's a lot of reasons for that. I, you know, obviously with the whole, sometimes there's problems with the adoption process with the original parents. And there's just a lot of stuff like that. But, um, and then, but there's kind of this mindset that people have when they go to adopt that they don't even realize that they have. It's this idea of you owe me. See, I have adopted you, so you owe me to act this certain way. Does that make sense? See, since I did you a good turn, you owe it to me to be the perfect child. And if you ask people who are just starting out at the adoption process, they say, well, no, I don't feel like that. Ask them again after they've gone through the adoption process. It's in all of us. There's this little bit of us in the back of our heads that we always feel like if we do something good, we, we deserve something. You know what I mean? Like, you owe me. And I'm not just talking about adoption anymore, as you can probably tell. I'm talking about anything. I mean, um, I remember, you know, doing a ministry in a church, for instance, and, you know, I thought, man, oh, man, now the pastor has to like me. I mean, I did this thing that nobody else wants to do. It wasn't this church. And the pastor's my dad. He, he'll never like me. <laughs> but I was at a different church. Um, you know, and there was just kind of this idea that, you know, well, the pastor owes me now because, I mean, I did him a favor. You know, and we don't like to admit that there's an attitude in us. No, no, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm good, I'm good. But the truth is, no, we all give a little bit grudgingly. There's always that one thing that we don't want to give. For some people, it's their money. You know, oh, no, he's going to talk about tithing again. But for other people, it's not money at all. They, they could give their money away all day. They don't care. It's other little things like... All their nice little goodies or their title some people they'll give away all the money that they want just as long as you recognize them for their good deeds I knew one church and this is not a joke that their incentive to give people to get people to give for new, new chairs which were pews they were upgrading from pews to pews I, I didn't get that but anyways their incentive was they got a plaque on their pew and reserved seating <laughs> wow. But wow. the room went up in the world. Now, see, for them, they could give up their money. They didn't care. It was a title. You couldn't rest, wrestle from them. Yeah. I'll do it just as long as you remember that I did it. So it was the power. It was all about power. Wow. So giving is a great idea, but too often we have an entitled attitude of you owe me when we're giving. And that's where the problem comes in. So last week we looked at seek God's kingdom and his righteousness more than anything. That is your goal in life, to seek God's kingdom and his righteousness. Okay, so this, this, this week we're going to look at the second command of that. These are all taken from Matthew in chronological order. Um, the second command is found in Matthew chapter 14. Starting in verses 13, going down to 16. Uh, now, when Jesus heard about John, this is his, his cousin who was killed. So, you know, that's kind of sad. Uh, he withdrew from there in a boat to a secluded place by himself. And when the people heard of this, they followed him on foot from the cities. Okay, so something bad happens. He, he withdraws. Okay, I, I, I kind of understand that. 
Um, when he went ashore, he saw a large crowd and felt compassion for them and healed their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This place is desolate, and the hour is already late. So send the crowds away, that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said to them, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, We have here only five, five loaves and two, and two fish. So let's look, let's look at this, okay? The second command, give them something. The first command was seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness more than anything. Now, that's kind of the idea there. But then seek, give, pray go. The same part, give. Give them something. Now, as I mentioned last week, all four of these commands still do apply to us today as people who uh, follow God. So let me kind of say one thing before we go there. Um, I think it's, oh no, I, 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 have a, I have a funny joke slide, but I don't want to skip ahead to it because then you'll see my notes. I might as well just go through the notes. So, okay, put a pin in it, guys. Okay, so um, last week we talked about, okay, seek, but if you seek without giving, this is what happens. If you seek without praying, this is what happens. If you seek without going, this So this week we're looking at giving. So what happens if you give without seeking? Well, if you give without seeking God's kingdom, your giving becomes aimless. You're giving, but there's really no reason for your giving. Maybe you'll throw out some money over here, or you'll throw out some time over here, or you'll, you know, you'll, you'll give away to people, and you'll be generous, but your giving isn't really focused on any intent and purpose. You're not trying to help people find God. You're not trying to make an impact in the community. You're just giving. If you're not seeking God's kingdom when you're giving, it's aimless. If you're not seeking God's kingdom while you're praying... Your giving is pointless. And if you don't seek God, if you don't give, sorry, if you don't get, if you, <laughs> I said that wrong, if you give without going, which is reaching out to others, not just missionary work, but anytime you reach out to others who are in need, your, your giving becomes hollow. See, because if I'm willing to give to something, but I'm not willing to go and serve for something, basically I'm trying to buy God off. You can have my money, you just can't have my time. Well, as Christians, we kind of have to put our put our feet where our money is. That kind of makes sense. You, it's not enough to just give to something; you have to go for something. That kind of makes sense. It's like this: you're living for God. You're not just giving Him money to keep Him at bay. Well, I paid my tithes, and I'll get off my back. You know, I supported this ministry, and I'll get off my back. You know, it, it's not like that. Um, if you, if you're get, trying to give without going, without reaching out to others in need, it's pretty hollow. See what I mean? Oh, I'll, I'll give my tithes, but then I'll see this, you know, this orphan in need, and eh, who cares? I'll drive right by somebody broken down on the highway and not even stop to help. See what I mean? I'll give... But when it comes to actually reaching out and touching people and, and loving them, that's too far. Giving is a lot more impersonal and it's a lot easier. So now, you know, this is kind of the idea that, that comes with giving that I want to look at. This, this is a guy who's signing a check to the church. And he, and he has the pastor shake his hand while this guy takes his photograph and the caption says, Most people thought he was a little too showy. <laughs> Look what I'm doing. And uh, that's kind of the importance of this. When you give, that's good. Give your time. Give your money. That's good. Give to them. Have compassion for people. Absolutely. But make sure you're seeking God's kingdom while you're giving because you want your giving to be for a reason. It will be aimed at something. You're trying to accomplish something. Give and pray while you give because you want your giving to have a point. Give and act and also reach out to other people and love them because you, you don't want to be hollow. God said it like this. He, he uses his own words. This is, um, I wish I could remember what it was. He said, you know, if I needed money, I wouldn't ask you. So let's just kind of get that out in the open. I, I don't need your money. I, you know, I only have on a thousand hills. I, I think I got this one covered. Don't worry about it. I obviously don't need your money. See, giving is not about what God needs. It's about what God wants. And there's a world of difference between those two statements. 
So, you know, here Jesus is. His cousin has just been killed, and all he wants to do is just get away from it. Have you ever, have you ever had a real tough loss, a real, real tough death, and all you wanted to do was just to be alone for a little bit? Maybe to pray, maybe to just process the information that this person has just died. You know what I mean? It, yeah, understandable. So, so that's what Jesus is doing here. But then his plans get a little bit interrupted here. Now, I don't want to get into the whole, you know, he was God, he knew that it was going to happen. Yeah, I know, I know. Just roll with me here. When he went ashore, he saw a large crowd and felt compassion for them and healed their sick. He saw them, had compassion, and diverted his plans. Now, if you look down here at 15, it says, this place is desolate and the hour is already late. This little diversion took up his entire day. It ruined his plans. I had plans, guys. Come on. And you, you don't see him complaining about it, though, either. And here's another thing. You don't see Jesus saying, I'll do this for me, but you owe me. How many times is that our exact attitude? I'll give, but I'm keeping record of how you inconvenienced me. You owe me. And here Jesus, God himself, the only one who, who has the right to say such a thing, and he's just, he does it of his own free will, doesn't complain about it. See, what we do is we like, to, we like to sacrifice, but then we like to complain about it. You know what I mean? Hey, uh, pastor, I'll help you, with, uh, I'll help you with, with picking up the kids, you know, for Sunday night service, but I won't like it. And I'll make sure to tell you that I don't like it every week. See what I mean? So, Jesus had compassion, so he did something about it. It's not enough to feel bad about something. We have to do something about it. I think we all know that there's a huge drug problem in the area. Did, did you know that? Yep. Is, this, is this news to you? It, there's a huge drug problem in the area. I don't know about the rest of the world, but I don't live in the rest of the world. But I know there's a drug problem here. It's there too. So what are we going to do about it? Yeah. See what I mean? There's kind of this idea, especially in, in a lot of Christian circles, where we see the problem, we complain about the problem, we say that we'll pray about the problem, but then we never get to the step of doing something about the problem. So, okay, here I am. There's a drug problem. Okay, so now I'm going to pray about it. Jesus, just help them. Amen. <laughs> and then where's the faith? Faith requires works. Seeing a problem does nothing. You have to do something about the problem. So we have a drug problem. What are we going to do about it? So, I mean, just think about this person. Just think about this. We have a problem with, with kids getting lost in the system. What are we going to do about it? Are we going to start adopting kids, or are we just going to keep saying, tough luck? I guarantee you, if you adopt, you will regret it at one point in your life. You have to keep pushing on past that. And you have to remember... Their life is worth it. Their life is worth it. Why should we do something about the druggies? Because their life is worth it. Their life is worth it. Life is too short to go around doing all the things we want for ourselves. Your house will fall apart when you're dead, I promise you. No matter what you do, you'll get mice in your house. No matter what you do, your car will fall apart. And guess what? When you die, you won't be crying for it. It'll be gone. Our life is much more than the things we wear. Much more than our relationships with people. I love Gracie, but it's till death do his part. It's not eternal. Our life is much more than our car. 
as a Christian, we all have to come to a point of saying, am I leaving a mark on God's kingdom or mine? It's not good enough. It's not good enough to settle for leaving a mark on your kingdom. It's not good enough. Jesus put it like this. Whoever looks back, they're not worthy of me. That gets me. Because when I die, I want to know I did something on the path. And I want more than anything when I get to heaven to hear God say, good, well done. All the pain, all the failure, all the heartache, it'll be worth it. With five seconds in heaven, it'll be worth it. I promise you. I sit my life on it. But I guarantee you, every second you spent on yourself, you will regret it. And there's nothing you can do about yesterday. But you can do something about tomorrow. And you can start today. Remember these things when you're praying for the dreadies of Tularosa. Remember these things when you're praying for those kids who don't have a home. Remember, because it's not good enough to do nothing. If Jesus had seen and done nothing, what good would that have been done? But he said this, he said, you give them something to eat. You give them something to eat. Jesus had a servant heart in all these things that he did. He never once said, you're lucky to have me. He never once said, I could have done that better. He never once nitpicked other people when they were doing his stuff. You, you never see him going to John the Baptist and saying, you're doing a good job, but I have some ideas. Why don't you do this, this, and this? You never see him doing that. Why? Was John the Baptist perfect? Was John the Baptist doing everything right? No. See, we've gotten in a rut a lot of times with nitpicking people. Now, when you're not the pastor, you don't think about it a whole lot. But once you're the pastor, you, you start realizing, man, people nitpick a lot. And uh, I'm not talking about myself, I'm talking about the pastor. I, I hear people say things about this guy all the time. It's just, it's a little bit disheartening, you know? You want, you want to feel like we're all in this together, and then, you know, you, you feel, you, you feel people, a few people say something, and it's like, Ouch, did you kiss your mom with those lips? I mean, that's a little harsh. You know, and uh, here's, the, here's the part that gets me about being a Christian. You have to forgive people. You know how much easier it is to just kind of, wow, you did me a wrong turn. Well, now the dragon is unleashed. Well, that's not how, that's not how Christianity works. You know, and... It's harder when you're a Christian because, I mean, when you're, when you're a pastor because you, you've seen what people have done to your leader, you know, and, uh, and then you have to stay out of it, and then you have to forgive the people who did it. As an associate pastor, that is very difficult. You know, we, we, we go to this leadership thing um, by a guy, his name is Chris Thompson, and one of the things he says is, faithfulness is I won't talk about you, but loyalty, loyalty says you won't talk about them either. There's a difference. I was, uh, I was, it was a couple years ago, they don't go here anymore, but there was someone who used to go here, and uh, you know, he, he, was, he was talking to this other person, and this other person was real disgruntled about pastor because basically he was bringing the church into the 21st century out of, you know, the 1700s. How, what a terrible pastor making us relevant to the community that's way ahead of us. You know, here's the thing, Tularosa is way behind in technology, and yet, we were behind Tularosa, man. So that should tell you how far behind we were as a church. You know, so here he is, and, and he's not doing anything that's worthy of rebuking.
But here, the, here this person is talking about how, you know, pastors are doing such a bad job and, oh, you know, terrible, terrible. And so then this guy says, yeah, you're not the only one who said that. So in other words, he was listening to this person gossip, and he had gossip with other people about pastor too, and then they were getting together and gossiping again. Whenever you hear someone say, you know, someone else was saying that about him too, you are involved in what's called a gossip ring. And here's a little, here's, here's my tie into this. You cannot possibly be giving if you're gossiping. Just store that away somewhere. Jesus never said, you owe me. He had a servant heart about the things that he did. Jesus didn't wait. He didn't wait until he was no longer hurting or in pain. There's this kind of idea that gets going around. It says something like this. You can't help people until you help yourself. <laughs> Wrong. You can always help someone. You can always help someone. Jesus was very here. You know what he did? He helped people. He helped people until the sun went down. And then he helped us more. Jesus at his deathbed, he still took the time out to teach his disciples. In his greatest moment of need, I would say he was hurting a lot. And he still took the time out for other people. Kind of an important point. So remember that the next time you have your bout of, oh, woe is me, I need to heal myself before I can heal anybody else. It's just not true. You know, part of the problem is that if you wait for yourself to be healed, you'll never do it. You'll always be broken. To some degree, you'll always be broken. You know the churches that don't go are the ones that say, we will become outward focused once we've set the things inside in order. They never get there, and the church never grows, because they're always self-centered Christians. When you do more, though, you think you're worth more. See, I, I lead music, so that means, you know, I'm worth two of every one of you. And then I'm a pastor, so I'm worth three of every one of you. And then, see what I mean? We do start having this tally system of how we're worth more than other people. And it's like, eh, I don't think you got the idea of giving. Positions are replaceable. People, people aren't. If I quit today, pastor will find another associate pastor. But he'll never find another Michael. I'm not saying that as a pride. I'm saying people are unique. I mean, you have kids. Look at your kids. Are all your kids the same? The position of child, you can, you can feel that. If your child dies, you adopt another one, right? Wrong. Because people are not replaceable. Positions are replaceable. Remember that. One of these days, pastor won't be the pastor here. Then another pastor will come. And he'll probably change things. That's what happens. You have to give past it. You know, helping one person won't change the world, world, but it'll change the world for that one person. As Christians, we have to be concerned for that one person. Yes. Jesus put it like this. Imagine I have a hundred sheep and if one gets lost. I will leave all 99 to find that one lost one. See the difference of perspective? With Jesus, it's not a numbers game. With Jesus, it's a heart thing. When you give, he wants all of you, and he wants you to give with his kingdom in mind. God doesn't need your money. Now, I, I should probably mention as a, as a brief disclaimer, I have run into people that are, um, it, it does happen, people who just do too much, and they kind of burn themselves out. Uh, usually leaders, but I guess it really happens with anybody. I'm not saying you shouldn't take breaks. I don't want to get sidetracked on this because it has nothing to do with my message, but Jesus took breaks. He, went, he got alone to pray, okay, all of those kinds of things. And then also God gave us the idea of Sabbath, a, a day of rest. It, it's okay to, to take breaks. I'm not saying anything about that. So now back on point, you don't have to be the best. I hope I got this one on here. Of course, now my thing's acting retarded. Uh, ben, there's something wrong with my clicker. Are you up there, bud? The answer is no. No, the answer is no. Uh, can you push the down arrow on the keyboard? The answer is no. No? <laughs> 
You can't? Okay. Well, I guess we'll just scoot past that, I guess. And tell me if you fix it. Uh, you don't have to be the best. You have to do your best. You don't have to be the best. You have to do your best. Did you know I'm not the best musician in the world? I'm okay with that. I'm not the best guitarist in the world. I'm okay with that. I'm not the best worship leader in the world. I'm okay with that. Not the best associate pastor. Oh, there it is right there. You don't have to be the best. You have to do your best. Don't compare yourself to who you were yesterday. Don't compare yourself to how other people are doing. Well, I'm doing a better job because, you know, Chuck didn't do that and I did that, so I'm better than Chuck. So, I mean, you're missing the point about giving. You don't have to be the best. You have to do your best. Use what you have. Ask God to provide what you don't. Start somewhere. I can't adopt. Okay, stop. Start somewhere that you can. Start some, with something that you can do. And reach out to fill a need. Maybe your neighbor is elderly and they can't get around. Can you help them with that? Something small. And then add to it the more confident you become. So with that, we're going to go ahead and close out here with a few um, other small things. Once again, helping one person won't change the world, but it will change the world for that one person. So just a few things finally. If you don't give, you will become stingy, greedy, and selfish. And I will say this. If you do give, you will struggle with greed anyways, and with selfishness, absolutely, and with entitlement. You know, some of the most entitled people I've ever run into is people who have been in church for forever and they pay tithes regularly. Well, Pastor, I've made a, I've made a cash donation to this. I've got stake in this. I, I've purchased stock in this business. And, you know, so... I, you, you, you need to do what I told you to do. You see what I mean? <laughs> and uh, you kind of get this idea that you need me. It's all about me. You don't know how many people in my life have tried to threaten with money. If you don't do this, I'm going to stop, stop giving ties and offering. Go ahead. Like, the church can't be bought. It's God's group, not a club. It, it, it's God's people. It's not, it's not a club. We don't, we don't do money struggles. Give time. Give from the things you have. Give your finances. There, there's, a, there's a hurricane going on. Give to hurricane relief. Give to support ministries like Teen Challenge. Help those who are trying. You know, I remember one time we were growing up in California, and there was this, this fat guy. I mean, just Man, was, I mean, this guy was huge. And uh, he was out, uh, he was trying to walk, but it really was more like a, I mean run, but it was more like a, a waddle walk. And, uh, you know, I, I, I was sitting there, you know, and being as a kid, I kind of got lost in my mind. And I was just thinking, man, that would kind of stink to be able to not walk around. And I remember my brother starts laughing at him. He says, uh, you know, basically calling him fat and everything. And, uh, you know, that kind of bothered me, because I, I didn't know why it, it bothered me. So I was sitting there later, later that night going to sleep, and I was thinking, why did that bother me so much? And, and now, 20 years later, I know why it bothered me. Because he was trying to do something better. He was trying. And see what I mean? It's okay to give and not do a good job giving. Give anyways. Give of your time, give of your resources, give what you can where you can to meet a need that you see. Maybe it's just watching your neighbor's kids for them while they do something, or I don't know, I, I, there's needs all around you. You'd be surprised that there really are needs all around you. So just a few simple ideas of, of ways you can, you can uh, put this into, into action. Uh, a simple way you could give is in your time to help someone around you. So, you know, this goes once again with what I was just saying. Uh, maybe look for needs uh, in your neighbors or look for needs at the school or at the police department. Go around just finding needs. Uh, one thing that we do is uh, we take a goodie basket to the police department once a month. Nothing big. You know, it's just something to say, hey, we're, we're thinking about you. And people, people need to know that they're important. You know what I mean? Everybody's important, you know? President Trump, you might not like him, but he's still important. President Obama, you might not have liked him, but he's still important. Everybody's important. 
the people in the schools, they're important. The teachers, they're important. You know, you are important. This idea of, of I deserve more because I'm giving is just, it's just stupid. Look for needs and you will find them, I promise you. Maybe you get to know someone who's lonely. Maybe hang out with them. Uh, I know a lot of people who are actually can't get out of their house. Just go over once a week and just hang out with them for an hour. Uh, maybe another idea is um, if you know a new mother in the area who can't afford diapers, buy her some diapers. It's, I mean, nothing big. Uh, maybe there's someone who can't really get out to go grocery shopping. Offer to take them. Offer to go with them. Offer to go for them. These are just some, some ideas and passing about how you can give in simple ways. So you don't have to be a billionaire to give. Even the smallest things have a big impact. So uh, uh, we're just going to close out. In, uh, you can, there's going to be food back there. If you want to go back there, that's absolutely fine. Joe will pray for the food uh, once you guys are all in there. Um, but if, if you just mind uh, praying with me for a minute. God, I pray that you would give us a giving heart. Help us to see the needs of others. Help us to not live for ourselves. Lord, last week we talked about how we need to, to, to seek your kingdom, how we, we need to live our lives for you. And this, this week we're looking at something that, that really closely applies to that giving. Lord, help us not to be stingy with our time, with the things that we own, with our money. Help us to see needs and to meet needs, God. Help us not to be content with nitpicking all the things that are wrong in the community, but instead to help someone who is in need. Lord, help us to be your arms and your feet in Tolerosa and in the Otero Basin. Your word says that we are your ambassadors. We're going in your place. So Lord, as we go in your place, help us to do what you would do, to have compassion for what you would have compassion on. Lord, give us your eyes to see the things that you see. God, we love you. I, uh, I want to encourage you uh, to just spend a few minutes.